I run around the, the world as APG president, and I'm always happy to see students around the world. This year, I've been to about 15 universities. Linda's been with me to most of them. We have probably talked to about five, 600 students, and one of the questions we get asked a lot is what are people looking for in new employees to the industry? So let's see here. We have a few slides that may be relevant to um, tonight's award winners. And by the way, congratulations to all the award winners. We have these APG DPA publications. Chan Wilhelm's here with, with me tonight. We worked on this uh, publication, and if, if you're a student or one of the advisors and you haven't gotten one of these books, we have a few left because we wanted you to have them. They have some incredible stories about men and women in the energy profession. So one of the things that we hear that companies and corporations and vice presidents and hiring uh, people are looking for are not just young professionals who understand the foundations of geology, who understand the way that the rocks are put together, the way that the reservoirs and seals are put together. They want people who can communicate. They want people who can manage large amounts of data because, as we all know, that's even more important these days. But you know what's really amazing to me is they want critical thinkers. People who can look at problems, work in teams, and solve complicated issues with diverse people with diverse backgrounds. And so that's the topic of discovery thinking. Let's talk about some of the incredible lessons that we can learn. Now this is a hand-drawn map that will be drafted, I promise. But what I do want to share is that for me, the adventure that John Tubb referenced all started at a, with a single APG event here in 1997. I'm wiggling the arrow. This is an event at the Dallas APG. Um, it was put together by our current APG Foundation Chair, Jim Gibbs, and it featured a panel on Wildcat. And I sat in the front row with Linda, we took 10 pages of notes, and it changed my life. And it's wonderful when events do that. And on this access are years so from 1997 to today, at around 2018, there's over 21 years represented on the x-axis. On the y-axis are events. So when I became president of HGS in 2000, I wanted to try something similar to the APG panel and get some of the great oil and gas finders to tell us how they did it. And so, we came up with a program called HGS Legends, and I have to tell you, if you wanted to pack the house back in those days, and today as well, just get a talk on a big discovery. But if you really want to understand the thought processes, have someone or a team who made the discovery tell you about how they did it and how they overcame challenges. And so what we did with Legends was a little bit softer. We really wanted to understand the thinking, the critical thinking, and we weren't sure if it was going to work. To be honest with you, it was a new thing. Well, we had 550 at the first one, and 550 at the second one, and after that, we were off and running. And so today, due to the good work of many individuals in this room, and including our uh, John Tubb, who is our current chair, we have had uh, 10 events. Um, these are each events, and, and hopefully they'll continue uh, many more. As John mentioned, there was a jump over here. As I saw that things were going there was a lot of interest in dinner meetings to talk about discoveries. I thought, well, why not take this to the APG annual convention, which we did. And when we did, we started noticing that the audience was packed. So we had a series of conferences at the annual meeting, and then in 2012 at the international meeting for APG. And what you notice is that the events are starting to stack up in a somewhat hyperbolic way here. And I think that's because there's a lot of interest in these topics. We've now come up, when we come to the Salt Lake City APG convention this May, it will be the 20th Discovery Thinking Forum. And as best we can tell, approximately eight to 10,000 people have attended those sessions, and we have tens of thousands of views online. We have uh, videoed many of them. And then, as John mentioned, 
we created a program called Playmaker. This was for the APG Division of Professional Affairs. And this was a slightly different riff on having people explain uh, exploration. It was a one-day immersive conference because everybody's busy and not everybody has three days or more to go to a conference. So if you get some of the best men and women explorers on a particular topic, oops, there's one right now, and you focus on the hottest plays of the day, these are the playmakers. And so, where we stand here in 2018, there's going to be a, a new branch on the tree, and that's going to be the super basins. So I just wanted to share this because it has some historical context. If you will, this is a mind map, and I took a course with Ed Tufty, who teaches how to communicate information and how to really understand thought processes. And he says basically just draw it out. So that was my hand-drawn attempt to show an evolution of an idea from the HDS legends to the discovery thinking at both the annual and the international conventions of playmakers and then beyond. What I would like for us to talk about is a quick stroll down memory lane. John, you mentioned the HGS Legends programs. I've, we've collected here some of the covers of the bulletins, and I think many people in this room probably have been to at least a few of them. How many people have been to every one of them? I'm seeing a few hands. That's great. That's great. And as John mentioned, we were pretty excited to have some of the legendary greats in 2000 and 2003. I still remember when George Mitchell told us at an HGS dinner meeting that our world was going to change. And we were all, what do you mean engineering and geology are going to combine in incredible ways? And we got to hear it first. And then when Linda was president, she took uh, time and did a, a Geo Legends program. As John mentioned, Andrea Reynolds contributed to the series with legendary fields. Um, Gary Colburn got Boone Pickens to come talk to us. And then this, I believe, was a John Tubb specialty. He got some of the greats here in the Houston community. And you'll recognize several of these people. Uh, Dick Bishop's here with us tonight. And we recently mourned the loss of our good friend John Amoruso, who came and told us. Each of these men were not only presidents of HGS, they're presidents of APG. They were active in sites. They were present, uh, active in the uh, Gulf Coast section. And what I think they exemplified to me is the importance of service, not just at APG or at HGS, but at all levels. And I think that's very critical because that way you understand all of the different societies. And then, John, you and I had a chance to work together. I think it was one of our first times we worked together. We put together the unconventional wildcatters. That was a lot of fun in 2012. And then the legends of sedimentology, my goodness, that was quite fun, and then the Legends of the Imperial Barrel Award, and I believe Mary uh, Broussard stood in for Brian Locke that evening. And then when Deborah Sacre was president, she just kept it rolling with geophysicists who have impacted geologists. And I always kind of think of a planetary impact or something. I was wondering on the choice of verb, but anyway, it was a great evening, and uh, you can see the speakers there. So that's the background. So you've seen kind of the context. It, the, the, the basic concept is what can we learn from discoverers because most of what we do in the energy business is about analog exploration. And so now we're jumping over to the main body of the talk, which is discovery thinking. And so for those series of 20 forums, the first and foremost one begins with Marlon Downey, and you couldn't do any better than Marlon's great quotes. And for those who are entering the industry, remember this. Geology is a science, but exploration is a business, my friends. And because, as Mullen reminds us, history is valuable, additive to personal experience, we need to study those who have come before. And that's why we have a book that has a lot of good stories about those uh, 101 uh, men and women who have come before. And Marlon also visioned the importance of looking at energy, oil from source to trap. He used to like to say, Think like oil, and that's even more important today than it is ever before. And over those discovery thinking forums, we made a promise 10 years ago. And you know the thing about promises? The best part about a promise is when you actually can fulfill it. 
there's a deep satisfaction. And when we made the promise to have 100, at least 100 men and women over the next 10 years speak about discovery, we weren't exactly sure if we were going to be able to do it. But we gave it a shot. We brought a lot of talented people together. And we've now had over 115 uh, speakers and co-authors present at these uh, Discovery Thinking Forums. I had a lot of talented co-chairs helped me organize it, Paul Weimer and Ed Dolly, and about uh, five or ten other people have contributed to organize these programs. And I like this photo montage, another thing I learned from Ed Tufty. So I'd like to feature a few vignettes, and you can't go wrong with John Amoruso. And when John gave his Discovery Thinking talk, I love this. He showed how Amoruso Field was found. And you know, what is the critical thinking? And I talked with him a few weeks ago before he passed away, and he reminded me. We talked about the story, and I confirmed it. So if you look at the Cotton Valley Shelf Edge here in East Texas, you notice that there's a couple of notches here. And what John realized, this is the critical insight for him, was that there were feeder channels up on the shelf that were focusing plastic sediments down the channel and using classic Rufus LeBlanc, water only goes one way, generally, downhill, and John surmised that turbidites might be found down dip of those feeder channels in this area shown in yellow. And with very little seismic, in fact, I don't think seismic was really even a part of the discovery you can now see where the Amoruso field in pink was to be found. It was a major insight, and I can tell you, and many of you in the audience may have seen similar situations. I know doing consulting work, Lynn and I have seen instances overseas where shelf edges have notches, and there are some incredible undrilled seismic amplitudes down on the flanks, on the slopes, and, the, and potentially turbidites. So file that one away. You may see similar situations. Another great uh, study worth making is we all know that the Permian Basin is extremely active these days. And Jim Henry gave us a talk on the beginning of the Permian Basin. And we'll just go through here of a couple slides the evolution of how it all came to be. So in the beginning, there were sprayberry wells, which didn't, this is a cross section showing the center basin platform and uh, the, the debris and deposits of the wolf camp. In the beginning, there were wells that didn't touch the wolf camp. They went to the sprayberry above, and a few wells went down into the wolf camp and got surprisingly good results, mostly close to the shelf edge where there was coarse grain detritus. And as the wolf camp play evolved in the Midland Basin, as we understand the story, wells were stepping out into more distal faces of the wolf camp until the rock became so difficult, it wasn't really conventional anymore, that it required horizontal drilling and, of course, the hydraulic fracturing and the various stages that took off in the basinal wolf camp play in the Midland Basin. And if you look at the schematics, it kind of looked like this. Here's uh, 1950s to 70s. So there was a sprayberry play. Then in early 2000, there was a deepening of the sprayberry to the wolf, wolf camp, but largely hugging the shelf in the conventional large detritus. There was completion of multiple zones and deeper zones. And then finally, various horizontal wells and additional horizontal wells, and then different variables of the horizontal wells is what was, in a nutshell, is how the Wolf Camp evolved in the Midland Basin. And then, for those of us who like innovation, and I know my good buddy uh, Niven Schumacher is in the audience from Noble Energy, and Niven and Henry Penny don't teach innovation. The major pivot was, once it was understood that how things were working in the Midland Basin, people realized, with all of these innovations, that the Delaware Basin was deeper, hotter, more pressure, and more economic. And so there was a major jump from the Midland from its inception. So there at about a minute and a half is 
the fundamental evolution of the Permian. And of course, it's still going strong, and there are still continue to be improvements. And as Jim Henry told us, geology is critical to understanding and exploiting the play. And as a geoscientist, I think that's really good to hear. Orion Skinner and the Whiting team in the Williston Basin. Orion was recognized by APG with Outstanding Explorer Award. Orion is an amazing explorer. And what he, his gift is that he has been able to identify the productive betches in the Bakken play. The pronghorn limestone, uh, upper and lower, lower Bakken shell, lower Bakken silt. And Orion has an amazing technique he does two-foot contours of some of the key layers. He hand contours it, and he uses a two-foot contour. That kind of reminds me of a guy named Jack Elam. When Linda and I were at RPI, he used to talk about the importance of very, very careful contours. And in addition, what has been a key to Orion's success, as he explains it, is using core and looking for correlating with exposure surfaces, and he and his team have really done, been successful at isolating new areas in the Williston Basin. Another great thinker is Bill Zagorski, and I just saw Bill at Nate last week. We're having a wonderful conversation uh, last Friday, and Bill still can't believe how big the Marcellus shell is, and so Bill gave several presentations and continues to present at APG Discovery Thinking Forums. Um, the Marcellus shell plate is behind the thrust belt, and of course it now includes the Utica. And at the, this is a few years ago when he presented, he, he was able to go from the integration of the very small to the very big. And the estimates of being 84 TCF and 3.5 billion barrels, Bill was just telling me a couple of days ago that he thinks that the Appalachian Basin has even far greater resources than that, which is absolutely unbelievable. Another case of discovery thinking is using seismic. So some of you may know the story about Lundin's discoveries in the North Sea. And there's two parts to this story. Every good story has a twist. So the first story is Lundin drilled into below the chalk into a very high gamma ray rock. Had they not cored it, they probably would have thought it was shale because it had extremely high gamma ray. The logs were at 40% shale, and of course what it was, it was a radioactive sandstone with Darcy quality rock. So that was mind blower number one. Nine, mind blower number Two, which probably was why the discovery was made, is there is a major basement high in the North Sea, and this has happened around the world. I've met a lot of people in the audience can think of cases where this has happened, and I know, I know of at least another case on my own, where early wells are drilled on the crest of a basement high, finding little or no sediment. It's the case of the bald high syndrome. And what Lundin was able to do with really high quality seismic was they were able to find these half grobbins on the flanks of the big that were filled with this incredible reservoir rock, source rocks and reservoir rock, the kind of reservoir that I just showed you. So this is a case where enhanced seismic imaging made all the difference. And it's really no difference than the Santos Basin where for the first time relatively recently. People have been able to look below the salt in what was an old basin and see an entirely new province. And it's really not that different than the Gulf of Mexico, where over the last 10 years we've been able to image below salt ex exceptionally well and finding additional targets. And Hans got the Outstanding Explorer of the Year award for that, and I'm very pleased to say Hans is the first non-American uh, or non-North uh, American to receive the award from APG. And since I'm president of APG, I'm also marketer-in-chief. That comes with the title. So I can't help but point out that we have a book on giant fields of the decade. 
I was fortunate to be able to work with Bob Merrill when we outlined some of the largest fields. Hey, it's fun to work on giant fields, and we've got 15 of them in this book, including the Marcellus and the other, and some of the others that I showed you, including Lundin. So, if you're, if you want a really good documentation of these discoveries, there's a resource for you. So, to sum it up, what have we learned from a decade of discovery thinking in these approximately 20 programs? Technological innovations, of course, are key. There are always uh, there's a key observation, and there's always, when people are trying to make a discovery, there's always challenges that they overcome, and it's very inspirational and instructional to hear their stories, how they did it. And I will also point out, by the way, we have a lot of these on uh, video, and a lot of the Playmaker programs that I'm going to mention in a second, also on video, and as John Tubb mentioned, HGS Legends programs on video. So guess what? At the end of this talk, tomorrow, we'll send out an email to all of the registrants to this meeting with the web links. Because if I were to show you the web links, nobody would be able to write them down, and nor, nor would I expect you. But we'll be able to share that in an email so that these are resources for you. And I think that one of the key lessons is that APG, HGS, professional societies, we play an important role in this technology transfer. So now, if you would, I'm going to thank the Discovery Thinking forum presenters. Imagine if you will Star Wars music in the background. <laughs> and let's see, Brian Frost, I know you're in the audience. Are there any other Discovery Thinking speakers in the audience? Would you please stand so we can recognize you? Thank you, Brian. So a quick two-step over to Playmakers. This is just an FYI section. Last February, we had the good fortune to have a Playmaker in Midland, and the audience was packed. Their presentations are all on the web, and they'll be included in the link that I mentioned. And we also had a program in May in Oklahoma City. And there's absolutely some fantastic talks on the scoop and the stack. And Chandler, I see you have a talk there. And one of the things, this came out of conversations with uh, Chandler and others, is, and Bill DeMiss, my colleague, for a paper we gave, the industry is not standing still. So as we look at some of the engineering techniques, increasing prop and concentrations, perfecting fluids in the hydraulic fracturing, largely to slick water, shorter stage lengths, lengths uh, longer laterals. What we're seeing is that we're getting multiple generations of completions. And what's really important is there's this up and to the left effect, Bill DeMiss and I like to call it, where you're getting improved well performance and you're getting better production faster. And what that does is some plays were not economically viable with Gen 1 technology, but with Gen 3 or Gen 4 or Gen 7 technology, they are. And one of the great plays is the Haynesville, which is having a boom, boom experience at this moment. And Chandler and I were talking about it. And lo and behold, there is an effort afoot, uh, April 26, to have a talk on Hainesville and re-emerging shell plays of the Gulf Coast. And that's being uh, chaired by Bill DeMiss and Tom Bowman. So I wanted to make you aware of that opportunity. It'll be at the Marathon Building, and it will be hosted by DPA and APG. So now, since, since I'm president of APG, I should say a few words on APG's goals. And we have three. The first one, is pretty important. It's we need to run APG as a responsible business organization. We want to be sustainable for the future and what APG had a lot of programs and a lot of budgets with $100 oil 
and we have to be sustainable for the long term. So we've, over the last couple of years, we've prioritized programs, looking for the things that make the biggest impact, that are good net revenue generators, and we've also looked at ways, not just to save costs, but to make money, and to find strategic alliances so that we can work in a more effective business setting. Number two is member engagement. We need to retain and recruit our members as much as possible. We know that industry is contracting. There's 30 to 45% less people over the last seven years in the industry. Those are numbers that we have from talking in industry. So it's not surprising that APG has about 30,000 members now where we've had over 40,000 in the past. But one thing we've noticed is that even though we may have 30,000 members, we have 70,000 people who use our products and services. So we have a bigger customer clientele. And so we're mindful of that because that, that enables us to address these customers so that we can provide better services and value to our members. And the third thing is really the most important thing, is valuable technical content. Professional energy events, publications, things that the men and women oil and gas finders can use to do a better job to deliver on their promises to their customers. And so with that imperative to be relevant and realizing that we're into an energy renaissance, this is the backdrop for the Global Super Basins Conference, which is the upscale. Previously, we've talked about individual discoveries. Then we talked about playmakers, which are individual plays. Well, now we're talking about basins and the importance of thinking holistically. So you can see the Permian Basin uh, highlighted in green. Let's see if I can point these out. You can see the Anadarko Basin, the Gulf of Mexico. By the way, congratulations. We all, all of us who live in Houston live in a super basin. The Appalachians is a super basin. So is Williston, West Canada, Alaska, and I'll define a super basin in just a minute. And of course, there are some super basins down in South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and you can see Southeast Asia. There are, of the top 25 super bases, IHS is one of the thought leaders has done a series of exercises of a potential 860 billion barrels of oil, not in new basins, but in existing basins using revised technology, hydraulic fracturing and enhanced seismic imagery being two of the main ones. A super basin has got 5 million barrels equivalent produced, more than 5 million left, many source rocks, multiple petroleum systems, an assemblage of various plays, various pays, but most importantly, infrastructure and established service sectors. And I love this, Permedia. So if you look at the peak production, these are years on the X, and uh, these are, this is the peak production in barrels, in million barrels for the uh, Permian Basin. You can see the heyday was in the 1970s, and it was a long, steady decline when I worked the Permian seriously in the 80s and 90s. And amazingly, a lot of companies got out of the Permian Basin. And starting in about 2005 and 2006, as Dick Stoneberger talks about, it all changed with hydraulic fracturing. And the current production peak is now above the previous peak. And I think this is true for at least a handful of other basins. He's talking with Bill Zagorski, and he believes it's true for the Appalachians, as is, I believe it's for uh, the Williston and several other basins. This is amazing. And so for the peak oil discussion, we have a double peak. And when you think about that, peak oil is an expression of the oil that people believe exists with the existing technology at that time and place. So the fact that we have a second peak tells us that the total petroleum system was not conceptually understood at the time. And so that's why we think there's a lot remaining in these super basins. And to just go through a couple quick, when you're a geologist, if you have a map and a cross section, you could generally get pretty far. So I would just like to show you a couple of characterizing for the West Texas and for the Gulf of Mexico super basins. So these are some illustrations courtesy of my good buddy Tom Ewing. And you can see the key source rocks in the Permian 
are Simpson, Barnett, and Woodford, and they're low in the sedimentary section, meaning that there are many, many reservoirs piled on on top of the, res on top of the source rocks. And there's a late stage salt that is a wonderful basin white seal. And it's a relatively structurally, there are large structures, but it's not exceptionally broken up. And from a map view, the amazing thing is that the Permian Basin is entirely in thermal maturity. In, as we talked about in the Delaware Basin earlier, where it's deeper, it's in gas. But it's not like half the basin is mature and the other half is not mature. It's all mature for something. So that's, those two combinations, the source rocks thicken the sedimentary section and the thermal maturity is what makes the Permian special. And if we compare it, Permian on the left and the Gulf of Mexico on the right, this, and these are of course schematic cartoons, the source rocks in the Gulf Coast are fairly deep in the section, uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous. And then as you can see, there is salt. So out there is salt capping part of it. But the Gulf Coast is a lot more complexly deformed than the Permian Basin. It does not have a shallow regional seal, and it has a lot of leakiness. But the good news is it has an awfully powerful multiplicity of source rocks. So it overcomes the leakiness. So we've just contrasted two super basins. And when you do that, it's important because you can begin to understand the history, the current potential of a basin, and what the future might be. So the concept is, with 25 onshore super basins, we would like the purpose of the APG conference that uh, John mentioned in March 27th is to look at as many of those super basins as we can to compare and contrast so that we can understand their geological architecture and so that we can share best practices, what's working, what's not working, from some of the North American analogs and look for some new places where energy can go. Because the APG strategy is go where the energy is. And geoscience is adds incremental value. So here's the conference. I can't resist, I have to show it. And one of the other things we want to share with APG members and all the geo geoscientists is, yes, we're going to video that conference, so that we'll be rebroadcasting so that people can benefit from it. And yes, we are going to institute a series of papers for the bulletin. Imagine if we had, for the top 25 energy-rich basins in the world, a landmark paper in the bulletin, just like Scott Montgomery used to do. Uh, remember those geologic notes things, where you could go and get fundamental information, 20 or 30 pages about a basin. The key source rocks, the key reservoirs, thermal maturity, basic facts, what was the history of exploration, what's going on now, what does the future of exploration look like? Well, we're already, we have commitments from eight authors, you can see the super basins listed, and the ones in green under lead author, we have about eight already committed papers for the bulletin. And so we're having a conference call on Friday to talk about uh, getting these into the bulletin over the next couple months. So you're going to begin to see, for 25 bases, if we roll out a paper every quarter, three or four papers a year, in five or six years, we ought to have most, if not all, of the super basins out. We'd like for it to go faster, but it may take several years. <clears throat> and so, if there's anyone who would like to work on a paper, a super basin paper for the bulletin, come see me. And you'll see in your March bulletin, <coughs> there's a summary about this initiative. And for those of you who are able to go to the APG convention in Salt Lake City this May, we're going to have a session on super basins. So this is not just something that we're rolling out in a conference. This is something that's going to be mainstream for APG. And we'll have Tom Ewing and we'll have uh, Saudi Arabia and Scott Tinker, you can be sure, has a lot of thoughts on this. And so this is, this is pretty much the final slide. What struck me when I got to thinking about 2018 and the Super Basins, which is our new initiative, as you may have already guessed, Marlon Downey's one of my heroes. We got to know him when I worked at Shell, and he worked at Pecton. He's been a friend of the family for many, many years. 
In 2000, when Marlon Downing was president of APG, he had a global imperative. There was a special conference in San Diego. Was anybody able to attend that? I, I know of not many. I was not, and it produced a memoir, memoir, APG Memoir 74, and I've recently studied that memoir. So the conference was in 2000, where are we going to go for energy for the next century? And the answer is, everywhere else but where we've been. So the conference was focused on frontier basin, going to new places. There was very little on going back to old basins. Well, here we are in 2018, and think how different the focus of the super basin conferences. We're going back to the richest petroleum basins because we can, because they have infrastructure. And the benefits are, as we all know, frontier plays are great, but there are a lot of advantages to taking advantage of the infrastructure. And so the future energy mix is going to be both. When people ask, are we going to focus on short cycle super basin resources? Are we going to focus on frontier long cycle? Things like have recently been announced. Maybe something will happen with the OCS. We're still waiting to see. But there are plenty of deep water sedimentary packages, exciting uh, sedimentary packages that are offshore but they take longer to get to, 5, 10, 15 years. So which is it, short cycle or long cycle? And the answer is both. And that's why I say to you students tonight, you've got a bright future. We're going to be working on energy well into the future, decades, maybe another century. APG has just finished our first century. We're, we're rolling into the first year of our second century. There's a lot of geoscience to do. Drum roll, please. All right. Well, with that, thank you. I, I appreciate your attention.